Okay, if we could uh, start finishing up, we'd like to welcome everyone today, the Federalist Society and the uh, Environmental Law Practice Section of the Federalist Society welcomes you all today to a very interesting panel on EPA's regulatory authority. Hopefully you're all in the right place. This is the uh, press club, so you could be for some much more exciting panel on uh, sex and the single uh, commentators or whatever. But anyhow, here we are. We're going to talk about the government. We're going to talk about EPA in particular. And hopefully at the end of this panel, we'll see that uh, EPA probably doesn't fit the normal conception a lot of people have of the government. That's the government that has the compassion of the, EP of the IRS, the efficiency of the post office, or the competence of Katrina. And nowadays, I'll have to update that joke to talk about the BP spill. Uh, and no one laughs, so obviously I think I should scrap that joke and start with something else. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about the broad statutory authority that EPA has to regulate pollutants in the environment. And more significantly, what are the limits on that regulatory authority? Should EPA consider the costs and weigh the, those costs against the benefits of each regulation? And we're at a very significant time, I think, for uh, the government. We now have one of the leading proponents of cost-benefit analysis, Cass Sunstein, overheading OIRA. We also have Executive Order 12866. We have all kinds of potential limitations on that discretion and that regulatory authority. We also have concerns about what kind of data, what kind of science can EPA rely on? Traditional questions of whether peer-reviewed is a requirement. We have statutes like the Endangered Species Act that say you must use the best available science. Note the word available, which is an interesting. We have the Data Quality Act out there to limit that. In court cases, and most everyone in this room is probably a lawyer, you're familiar with the Daubert uh, principle, that is, the judges will have to imply when they look at uh, when they look at science. We also, of course, are very familiar with the precautionary principle. Uh, those of us in the chemical industry are facing this because of the EU's uh, regulation under REACH. But here in the states too, there's been a lot of talk about the reg pr the application of the precautionary principle by the EPA. Now, EPA or the U.S. government and industry does believe in the precautionary approach, as uh, exemplified in the Rio Declaration, principle number 15. But that principle is slightly different than what most people, or that approach is slightly different than what most people talk about when they talk about the, reg the precautionary principle. But just as a background for two seconds, that is based on science-based risk management, plausible scientific information, likelihood of causal relationships, cost-effective procedures, and most importantly, and this is something that most people, I think, overlook, the value that is foregone if you take an action or if you omit to take an action. That is something that usually the proponents of a precautionary principle approach do not consider. You can't assume that there's no detriment if you take some action or if you don't take an action. You could create new risks. So we have a lot of issues in front of us and we have in front of us a most distinguished panel, a panel of experts to address these issues and with one potential test case, the atrazine, the EPA's re-review of, re of atrazine as one that I think most of the panelists are going to at least touch on. Atrazine being the most commonly used herbicide, uh, one of the most commonly used herbicides in the, in the U.S. I have a very easy job as the moderator. I have to introduce this distinguished group. Uh, and it's much easier than, uh, a, than a moderator had last week. I was in a panel in which the moderator was introducing his uh, co-speakers, and at the end, he was at a loss, and he said, well, this is a man who's a legend in his own mind. Uh, I don't have that problem here. These people are legends in their fields, to say the least. We're going to give each speaker six to eight minutes, 
uh, to talk, to give an overview, then the potential for the speakers to talk, uh, to ask questions or rebut amongst themselves, and then we'll open it up to you. And if this is anything like normal Federalist Society uh, conferences, I'm sure none of you are going to be wallflowers. Uh, we're going to start in this order, and we're going to start with Robert Verchik. He's the Deputy Associate Administrator in the Office of Policy, Economics, and Innovation at EPA. He's currently on leave from Loyola University in New Orleans, where he holds an endowed chair in environmental law. He's a graduate of Stanford University and Harvard Law School. And his newest book is Facing Catastrophe, Environmental Action for a Post-Katrina World. Next, we'll hear from Ronald Cass who is the Dean Emeritus of Boston University's School of Law. He served as Dean there from 1990 to 2004. He's also now the President of Cass Associates. He's been a Commissioner and Vice Chairman of the International Trade Commission under Reagan and Bush One. He's currently a conciliator for the International Settle for Investment of Investment Disputes, and his term ends there in 2014. He's been involved with numerous institutes, including the uh, ABA's section of environmental law and the Federalist section of environmental law. He's a major, he's a co-author of major books, including a major administrative law handbook. He's a graduate of UVA and of Chicago, University of Chicago Law School. Next will be Jason Schwartz. He's a legal fellow at the Institute of Public Integrity at New York University School of Law. He's been an associate at the DC offices of Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman. He's also been a legal intern at the Environmental Defense Fund, NRDC, and the EPA. He's a graduate of NYU uh, Law School and Harvard University undergrad. And last, Jeff Clark, who's a partner at the law firm of Kirkland Ellis here in DC. He's an appellate litigator. From 2001 to 2005, he was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the Department of Justice. He's now a very active practitioner in virtually every circuit court and the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, he also is an adjunct professor at George Mason University Law School. And he went to Harvard undergrad and Georgetown Law. And with that, you can see we have a very distinguished <coughs> panel. And we'll start with Rob Perchick. Rob Perchick. Hi. Every, uh, can you hear me? All right. Oh, OK. Uh, well, I'm just happy uh, to be here. And, and I'm really honored, actually, to be uh, at the same table with the folks here. And I'm glad to be at the Federalist Society. Uh, I've, never, I've never been at a Federalist Society meeting before. <coughs> Um, but the food's good, so I'm happy. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about risk management, and I'm going to talk about atrazine. But I'm not going to talk about them both at the same time. And that's because the EPA, is, as is just discussed, has launched an evaluation of atrazine for the purposes of determining whether we need to change our approach to atrazine. And I don't want to prejudge or second guess anything that the EPA is, is, is going to do or decide. Um, so I am here to enlighten, I hope, as best I can, but I'm not here to make news today, all right? Uh, but still, you might be happy that, that I came. Uh, I am the Deputy Administrator of the Policy Office at EPA, and the Policy Office is the office that oversees all of EPA's regulatory practices. Uh, we have folks from our office on every work group and pay attention to all the rules as they're being developed. We also house uh, the agency's largest staff of economists, which is the National Center of Environmental uh, Economics. And our office represents the EPA in its communications with OIRA, which is, as you know, is the White House, uh, the OMB's Office of, of Regulatory Review. Well. In talking about risk management, I just want to contrast two different ways of approaching environmental problems and other regulatory problems. One I'm going to call pragmatic precaution and the other is cost-benefit analysis. Uh, concerning regulation, almost everything that EPA does um, is driven by some version of what I'll call pragmatic precaution. And what I mean by that because definitions are really important in this field, uh, is that first, when a threat uh, to public health is sufficiently serious, the agency should address it. That's the first belief. 
Uh, second, uh, it should do so even if the cause and effect relationship is not completely understood by science. Uh, and three, in addressing the threat, uh, practical considerations like workability, often cost, even sometimes benefits, should be taken into account. Um, that's a system that's worked pretty well for EPA. We're coming up on 40 years, and we basically used that system. Uh, why? Because it, that's the, the system that, that's hardwired into the statutes. That's our congressional authority. And so we have, uh, in some cases, health-based standards, uh, which uh, help us navigate air, uh, ambient air pollution standards that are famously cost-blind. Uh, we have a lot of uh, technology-based standards, which are essentially cost-effectiveness standards that dictate our uh, protection of air toxics and a lot of water pollution. And then we have what I call open-ended balancing standards, like uh, we use for pesticides, um, that, uh, that uh, ask the agency to consider economic, social, environmental costs and benefits. Uh, but uh, there's no particular weighting involved in many of those factors, um, and uh, sometimes it's, it's done without um, certain kinds of monetization that, that you would see in traditional CBA. Um, we could contrast that with cost-benefit analysis, or for those who are hardcore, benefit-cost analysis. Uh, and we do that, too, at EPA. Uh, but for uh, the most part, it doesn't drive our decisions. And the reason it doesn't drive our decisions is that, for the most part, uh, with some caveats, um, our congressional mandate does not allow it to drive our decisions. Uh, but uh, we do use CBA uh, for the purposes of, uh, of, of White House oversight. And so by CBA, just to be clear, I mean comparing social costs and social benefits of a, regula of a regulation, um, usually uh, by monetizing the monetary and the non-monetary costs and benefits, um, and usually uh, applying a discount rate, which is applied to non-monetary benefits um, as, as well as non-monetary um, costs. Uh, so that's what OIRA uses, and it's in contrast to the first system, which has a congressional mandate, and so when we do CBA, it's mainly because we have an executive uh, mandate to do it. Uh, CBA uh, is, is helpful in some ways. It's narrow in many others. Uh, it's not very good at dealing with distributional effects, benefits based on that, or intergenerational problems. Um, as I write I in my book, it's particularly not good at uh, addressing issues of low probability, high impact events like, like disasters. Um, but uh, it, it, it does serve some purposes for the government. And uh, if you have doubts about the EPA, uh, one of the things, OMB just recently in, in its uh, draft report found that EPA um, actually, in terms of all of its programs, uh, produces net monetized benefits per year of somewhere between 50 and 500 billion dollars. Um, so even under this measure, uh, we think we're doing, we're doing something right. We're bringing a lot of, of, of value in that way. So let me just say two minutes worth on atrazine to get things started. I think the reason that atrazine is part of our talk today is uh, that it's a great case study. Uh, one, because, the, because atrazine, the pesticide, has great economic value. Uh, in the United States, and two, because there is some scientific uncertainty surrounding its effects on public health and the environment. So last October, EPA launched a new evaluation of atrazine to determine uh, the effects on, on humans, whether or not it should revise its policies. Now, um, atrazine is, I, I think, the most widely used agricultural pesticide in the United States. It's, you find it a lot on corn and sorghum and sugar cane. We put 76 million pounds of it uh, into the environment a year. Uh, the EPA has estimated that it produces about $2 billion worth of benefits in, in economic uh, monetary benefits. But it gets in the drinking water, children get exposed to it in, in lawns, farm workers get exposed to it in the fields. Uh, it's associated with some non-cancer effects like disruption of heart activity, lungs, and kidneys. Uh, some studies associate it with cancer effects like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate cancer. As late as uh, 2003, EPA found that uh, atrazine was not likely to cause cancer in humans, but since then there have been at least a few uh, population-based studies um, that have thrown that into question. And so the EPA is uh, evaluating all 
uh, uh, laboratory and population studies, including those after 2003. It's seeking advice from a science advisory panel established under our pesticides laws. Uh, and it is uh, going to reach its conclusions and then subject them to independent peer review in uh, September, so coming up uh, this fall. It will then ask uh, a science advisory panel, the same one, to look at the potential effects of atrazine on amphibians because there's some concern that there may be a link between atrazine and reproductive deformities in, in frogs and, and other amphibians. Um, that uh, also will, uh, all of this that I'm telling you about the, uh, the, the scientific advisory panel meetings will all be open up to the public uh, and EPA right now is conducting meetings with stakeholder groups of various sorts uh, to talk uh, about atrazine. So that's probably enough to get us started in, in terms both of uh, risk management and atrazine. Thank you very much. Well, I, <coughs> I appreciate the invitation to be here and I appreciate the introduction. Uh, once when I was in government, I was uh, in St. Louis, and uh, the fellow who introduced me was at a loss for words, and he said, uh, uh, and, and now for the latest dope from Washington, here's Ron Cass. <laughs> this was a, a much more generous uh, introduction. We, we're talking a lot uh, here about uh, different ways of making decisions, and you're, you're talking about cost-benefit analysis and about the precautionary principle. Uh, Rob was right to, to start uh, with an invocation of the fact that as a government official, he's got statutes that tell him what to do. They set out certain criteria. There are a bunch of different criteria and the different statutes that uh, EPA deals with. But what's really at stake here is a fundamental difference in the way people look at the choices we have to make. And even though we'll talk about a lot of the uh, particulars in the decision-making process, we really do have different ways of approaching this. And one way, the way that is usually classified as cost-benefit, although it uh, also goes by a lot of other names, is to really say before we make a decision, we want to know everything that is really at stake on both sides of the ledger. And we want to have them in the same sort of piles, and we want to think about them together, and we don't want any one thing driving our decisions. You know, if you go shopping for a car, you don't walk into the car dealer and say, I'll take that one. You look at the price. You look at what comes with it. You look at what other cars are around. You, you don't, in your life, ever make decisions without some form of implicit or explicit weighing of the costs and the benefits of the decisions. It's just, it, it's normal common sense to look at both sides of the issue. If you think that looking at both sides of the issue will bring you out in the wrong place, then you don't want to do that. If you're a teenager who wants your parents to buy you a car and you know which car it is, you know that you want it no matter that there is a car they will think is more sensible and better priced and easier to, to get for you, you don't want them doing cost-benefit analysis. You want them invoking some other sort of principle. In today's world, in a lot of different areas, not just in the environmental area, in a lot of areas, people talk about the precautionary principle, which really means I don't want to do the careful weighing and balancing. I want my bias of one sort or another to win. So whether we're talking about security, and we say if there's any threat, however remote, of a security breach, we should do X, or we're talking about the environment, and we say if there's any chance of this, we should do X. Paul Krugman, when, when talking about different things, whether it's financial reform or climate change, will frequently say we owe it to future generations to invoke a precautionary principle. Now, if you say that, it sounds very good. It sounds like we're being careful and cautious, when really, most of the time, it's just the opposite. When Paul says that when it comes to climate change, we have to invoke the precautionary principle, if there's a 1 in 100 chance of a catastrophe, we really need to have that drive the equation. Why 1 in 100? Why not 1 in 10 or 1 in 1,000 or 1 in a million? Doesn't it depend on how big the catastrophe is? Doesn't it depend on how firm the risk assessment is of what the likelihood is this will occur. And everybody reasonable, you know, when, when you do your analysis, everybody reasonable is going to say, well, sure. When we talk about precaution, we don't really mean 
that any risk of this will drive us in that direction. But that is what the argument is intended to do. Precaution, in the sense of putting different weights on things, is built into a lot of different legal decisions. Think of the criminal justice system, where we have the standard of proof, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. That's designed to say, we think that in a world where we don't have absolute certainty as to what the information is we're dealing with, what really happened, who did what when, we want to err in a certain direction. And we do that a lot of the time. But usually we do it because we say the values line up that way. The costs and the benefits really do line up that way. And the decisional tools we have are such that we think there is a sort of distortion already built into the system. We want to correct for that. When you hear people talking about precautionary principles, you have to hear it with a lot of care. In the area, you know, if we're talking about chemicals, pesticides, every pesticide has a risk. Not using pesticides has a risk. If you wind up growing fewer crops more expensively, then there are people who won't get as much food. They won't get it with the same level of freshness, the same level of quality. We won't be able to feed the malnourished in the world. All of these things are effects of biasing decisions one way. There isn't a way to take risk out of the equation. There isn't a way to do away with the problems that you introduce anything into the environment or take anything out of the environment. A lot of things change that we don't know about. But what we ought to have in mind as people are talking these days about precaution and the need for precaution, particularly in the wake of the catastrophe in the Gulf, you'll hear a lot of people saying, we need to have uh, a, a stronger precautionary principle. No, we need to have a smarter way of trying to do the analysis of what the costs and benefits really are and of lining incentives up in a way that makes sure people take the appropriate actions. We will never get it right. We will never get it perfect. But we ought to do the best, most sensible job we can. And that means making sure we know the costs, that we know the benefits, we consider both, we consider them together, and we line them up with as great a certainty and clarity as we can when we're making our decisions. Well, I'm going to be the oddball and use the PowerPoint presentation. So. Someone could put the little projector there. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about White House checks on agency authority, particularly through review of cost-benefit analysis. Can you just somebody dim the lights because it's impossible to see? Uh, I think maybe I think all Derek can, can work on that, but we'll <laughs> do our best here. Um, so first, to, to introduce myself, um, Policy Integrity, which was founded by Ricky Rivez and Mike Livermore, who are sorry they couldn't make it here today, um, promotes balanced cost-benefit analysis, which we feel quite often supports progressive government regulation. So as you all know, um, the White House has many tools to influence agency decisions, um, appointments, the bully pulpit, um, but the last few items listed here, budget, information, cost-benefit analysis, these are powerful tools wielded by the White House's Office of Management and Budget. Um, so we're going to use atrazine as a case study of OMB's influence, both looking at what's already happened and then trying to predict the future a little bit. So first, an obvious point about money. Um, money can determine whether, how fast, and how far an agency is going to act. Uh, through money, the White House or Congress can impose priorities on an agency's regulatory authority. Um, EPA's endocrine disruptor screening program, which will review atrazine, uh, is a decade behind in its work, partly due to budget cuts. Um, but this year, the budget, which is overseen by OMB Director Peter Orzag, um, will finally give EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson a, a small increase for chemical screening. On the management side of OMB sits the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Historically, OIRA has used its review powers to slow down or weaken more agency rules than it has strengthened. Um, but OIRA's newest administrator, Cass Sunstein, believes economics sometimes supports regulatory action over inaction. Sunstein's personal views are a good indication of where OIRA is probably heading, so we're going to talk about them a little. Um, Sunstein strongly believes in cost-benefit analysis, 
but only as a tool, not as a straitjacket on agency of discretion. After all, cost-benefit analysis is only a proxy, uh, an imperfect proxy, for measuring actual social welfare. But sometimes a proxy is, is the best we have. Uh, still, Sunstein wants to improve and humanize analysis, which I'll talk more about a little, uh, a little later. Um, as we've heard, cost-benefit analysis is often contrasted with the precautionary principle. Sunstein believes in the goal of precaution, reserving the right to act even in the face of uncertainty. But thinks pr the principle offers no real guidance for government. Um, because what should we be precaution precautious about? Uh, the low prob probability of catastrophic environmental harm from releasing genetically modified crops, or the low probability of catastrophic hunger if we don't use GM crops. People tend to focus their precaution on whatever risks they're most familiar with. They tend to ignore the actual probabilities of worst case scenarios. They tend to think that their status quo is the best arrangement, and they tend to overlook complex interacting events. So I'm gonna move a little quickly through this slide, but it's about OIRA's ability to influence agency discretion uh, by controlling their access to information. In 2009, EPA ordered more test data from manufacturers of chemicals like atrazine. After meeting with stakeholders, mostly on the industry side, OIRA edited EPA's order, instructing the agency to accept more existing test data to the greatest extent possible, instead of always requiring new tests uh, using updated methodologies. Now, I'm not going to comment about who was right and what outcome was legally correct, but OIRA's decision was clearly not rooted in a precautionary principle type of thinking. It's also not clear that it was based in true cost-benefit analysis um, of the value of new information. Mostly OIRA was responding to stakeholder concerns, and industry remains better at influencing OIRA than advocacy groups. This has historically been the case, and so far it hasn't changed o under Obama. During 2009, industry and its allies met with OIRA about 10 times as often as advocacy groups did. Advocacy groups aren't as comfortable conversing with OIRA in the language of economic analysis, and they often overlook or, or lack the resources to participate in these types of preliminary stages of the regulatory process, and they end up ceding the ground by default. So moving now to my last topic, under presidential order, OIRA reviews the cost-benefit analysis of all major regulations. Since agencies are instructed to maximize net benefits, how an agency calculates the costs and the benefits often determine what regulatory alternative is selected. It so happens that the laws governing atrazine, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act, and the Safe Drinking Water Act, not only permit the use of cost-benefit analysis, they actually require it. So when EPA last reviewed atrazine, it, it didn't actually do such a great job on costs and benefits. In its cost analysis, EPA calculated that restricting atrazine would result in crop losses and increased farming costs totaling $2 billion per year. But EPA admittedly used imprecise estimates based on old data that did not factor in the latest, let alone future, technologies and farming practices. EPA also made worst case assumptions, even though it knew the scenarios were unlikely. For example, EPA calculated cost of a complete ban of atrazine for sugarcane, even though EPA thought 73% of sugarcane acres could cut atrazine use by up to a half, simply by switching to better spraying techniques. So in short, EPA was precautious about the risk to economic status quo. It overemphasized a few salient economic losses, ignored the low probability of its worst case scenarios, and failed to consider how farmers would adapt from the status quo in the face of new regulatory challenges. Meanwhile, EPA did not apply such precaution to analyzing benefits. Instead, because the science was uncertain, EPA chose a loose qualitative discussion rather than a rigorous quantitative analysis of various regulatory alternatives. As a result, EPA did not substantially change atrazine's status. So how would Sunstein have fixed EPA's analysis of atrazine? Well, to start, Sunstein wants numerical probabilities attached to outcomes. You can't always do that, so when it's impossible, uncertain catastrophes should still be avoided. And sensitivity analysis can be helpful. That means, how much would this benefit have to be worth for benefits to at least equal cost, and do we think that the benefit's likely to be worth that much? 
Next, we need more information, better numbers. Atrazine and other chemicals could have long-term health risks, but our current values for risk assessment don't deal well with latent risks. Also, all regulatory alternatives should be given quantitative analysis, and after a regulation is adopted, retrospective analysis can help us refine our numerical assessments for the next time around. Finally, cost-benefit analysis should be humanized. The analysis should give appropriate weight to qualitative costs and benefits, so the decision makers have access to all the information, not just the quantifiable information. And a lot of work remains to be done on supplementing cost-benefit analysis with dis distributional analysis, and we're likely to see environmental justice as a renewed focus for this EPA and OIRA. So would any of this have actually changed EPA's ultimate decision on regulating atrazine? Well, perhaps we'll see as EPA moves forward with its review this year. And we are already seeing some changes to cost-benefit analysis under OIRA, both at EPA and in other agencies. But work remains, as we saw very recently in the cost-benefit analysis for EPA's coal ash rule. After coal is burned, ash remains as a potentially dangerous waste. Ash can be recycled into construction, landscaping, and other applications. And normally, when a waste product gets regulated, recycling increases. EPA expects that once its proposed coal ash rule takes effect, recycling will increase, generating economic benefits. But industry worried if ash gets labeled as hazardous waste, the stigma could force all recycling to stop. Because of this hypothetical fear, unsubstantiated by the evidence, OIRA insisted that EPA calculate the worst case scenario of an end to all ash recycling, losing all those economic benefits. To compound the problem, EPA did not assign this scenario its low probability weight, but instead presented it as equally likely as the increased recycling scenario. So the problem is probability neglect. The result may very well be the selection of a less than optimal regulatory alternative. And the cause is that industry still has a disproportionate influence over OIRA, OIRA because so few advocacy groups seek meetings because so few of them speak in the terms of economic analysis. So there is some work left to be done, clearly, to balance the White House's influence on agency discretion. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeff? Yes. <clears throat> I guess the lights can come back up. <laughs> well, I'm Jeff Clark, and I'm also glad to be here, glad to be invited by the Federal Society. Mm -hmm. Also uh, glad to uh, be here with my fellow panelists and, and to be speaking to you. Uh, I want to talk to about two things, uh, really, I guess, and I'm the only thing that stands between you and the questioning period, which, as uh, Doug noted, is very important to our Federal Society uh, members. Um, and those two things are, first, I want to talk about, uh, you know, potentially a policy proposal slash a, a, a doctrinal proposal uh, on a clear statement rule, and then second, uh, talk a little bit about uh, atrazine and my understanding of that, although obviously uh, seeing what uh, the review process produces will be the, the ultimate judge of, of how that uh, procedure is going to turn out. Starting with the, the, the clear statement rule, uh, you know, let me say that uh, on that, on that point, uh, uh, Congress appears to be doing a pretty bad job, really a job of advocate, advocating its role in making the fundamental policy choices about how to regulate. It's the rare statute, few and far between, that tells you that you have to look at, at uh, costs and benefits explicitly. Most statutes are incredibly vague about that, and it leaves the courts floundering. They look around for sometimes the most tenuous evidence, either in legislative history uh, or in structural arguments. Uh, and it would be a lot better, I, I would think everyone could probably agree with this, if Congress made the fundamental choice about how to do cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and the problem is that Congress really isn't going to do that analysis most of the time because it's hard and because it makes them very accountable for their decisions. Uh, and also because the, the major check that kind of forced them on doing that has been weakened uh, of late, the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, the non-delegation doctrine, if, if it were, uh, you know, functioning probably uh, as it should, would require, would have required Congress essentially to make some of these fundamental policy choices clearer. But that's not the way the doctrines worked out. 
So if Congress isn't going to do its job voluntarily, and if there's not going to be a sort of strong version of the non-delegation doctrine, consider whether there should be a weaker doctrinal form. Consider whether there should be something like a clear statement rule. Clear statement rules in, in the law protect all kinds of things. They protect uh, federalism values. There's the Ashcroft v. Gregory rule that if you're upsetting the traditional balance of, between the states and the federal government that you need a clear statement from Congress to sort of get there. There's also another one in the federalist area. I'll just use those two as the, as the federalist examples uh, of the uh, 11th Amendment, that if Congress wants to use its uh, 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 14th Amendment Section 5 powers to overrule the 11th Amendment to override it. It needs to say so with, uh, with clarity. Why shouldn't there be a clear statement rule for cost-benefit analysis that essentially says that if Congress doesn't make clear what, uh, you know, how to treat cost-benefit analysis, that agencies should be required to do it. That would make it judicially reviewable, and that would avoid this abdication problem. It would also make everything above board so that you could see it in the courts, so that those who thought that rules were, uh, you know, being uh, imposed improperly uh, could challenge them in the courts, and you could see how the outcomes would emerge. Uh, this is an issue that, that the Supreme Court's really struggled with, from the cotton dust case, to the benzene case, to the American trucking case, and to the, uh, uh, the energy case, the, the riverkeeper case about the cooling water towers. If there were a one-size you know, approach of a, of a clear statement rule would help to, to avoid what continues to be an endless set of controversies in the Supreme Court's cases. So, uh, and then why is it there is an existing rule that's like a clear statement rule in the benzene case, not quite a clear statement rule. The court read uh, a health and safety statute there to, to impose a significant risk requirement in order to avo avoid non-delegation doctrine problems. It's not quite the right uh, approach because it doesn't really get to the process of doing good cost-benefit analysis or having agencies uh, uh, consider that as an approach. So that's the, that's the proposal, and we can uh, talk about it both in your questions and, and with the other panelists. Let me talk a little bit about uh, atrazine and why I think there's a, a missing ingredient that we haven't uh, talked about yet or broached, uh, and why I'm skeptical about that and, and how that process might come out. And that's to be informed in part not just by neoclassical economics, which has really uh, given us cost-benefit analysis, but by uh, public choice economics. And in particular, I'm worried about uh, the fact that atrazine really is threatening to become almost another asbestos. There are six cases pending now uh, in, uh, in Illinois, uh, and they're being driven by asbestos lawyers. And they're, uh, I think they threaten to do damage to the law, and they threaten to uh, uh, really you know, become almost an engine of growth for the plaintiff lawyer industry. The fact that we're seeing a reexamination of atrazine at the same time that those cases are going forward makes me, from a public choice standpoint, uh, worry a little bit about exactly what's motivating this, in particular because this issue was looked at as recently as 2006 in an extensive uh, re-registration process for atrazine, and EPA pronounced it, as, as one of my panelists was, uh, fellow panelists was noting, as generating billions of dollars in benefits for the economy. So if it's generating billions of dollars of benefits, if it's never really been seen anywhere in the world, it's never been banned before, uh, as having you know, net benefits, why, why now? It seems almost too coincidental. I'll, I'll take you back to one uh, story, and then I'll let you get on to the questioning period, about how I saw the FIFRA process, that's the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, sort of twisted by uh, you know, plaintiff's lawyers' concerns. There was a, you know almost unbroken streak of uh, pro-preemption, I think very clear and decisive Court of Appeals decisions on FIFRA preemption. Uh, that built up in the 1990s. And all of that essentially was destabilized by one amicus brief that the Clinton administration filed, uh, seemingly at the behest of the, the plaintiff's lawyer industry. And that resulted in uh, what was taken to be a regulatory gap, because the EPA doesn't generally look at pesticide efficacy issues. And that whole stable regime, which promoted uh, economic benefits for the industry, and I think for the American consumer, and certainly for the American farm industry as well, was upset and eliminated because of that uh, single brief without any fundamental change in the law, without any fundamental different instruction from Congress. 
it's something that that uh, that I think is troubling, and I worry given that uh, these atrazine cases are really uh, getting going, and they look like they're going to be cash cows for the for the plaintiffs if they can win one. Uh, about that same kind of history repeating itself. So with that, I will stop my presentation. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it's quite evident that we we have a very consistent set of themes here in, with the four panelists. I mean, I think if we, we look at it in one aspect, Ron has in, indicated that the precautionary principle is one way to get around cost-benefit analysis, to bring in the political motiva motivations that certain individuals might or groups might want. Rob, in defending uh, CBA, cost-benefit analysis from the agency, has really pointed out the detailed work that the agency does in that regard and its benefits that, that result. Jason has pointed out that OIRA, which is one of the limits on uh, agency activities, uh, he thinks really hasn't been doing its job and perhaps might be too influenced by political uh, influence of, in this case, industry. And Jeff has really said well, maybe one route out of this is the clear statement rule, a way to overcome all this political uh, back and forth that undermines the, the legal process. Let me just add one little piece of information if we're going to get into a thorough discussion of, of atrazine at some point, and that is so that everyone knows atrazine is obviously regulated under FIFRA, as Jeff indicated, and FIFRA has an explicit cost-benefit analysis requirement in it for EPA, and it has, in a sense, two standards that EPA has to regulate to. If it's a food item, uh, ultimately if the pesticide is used in creation of a, a food product, it has to, EPA has to regulate to the standard of reasonable certainty of no harm. If it's not a food item, no dietary, it has to regulate to no unreasonable adverse effects on the environment or humanity. So that's the standard and it has a requirement specifically in the latter to really look at the cost and benefits. Uh, I think with that, I'd like to open it up first to the panelists to see if they would like to, uh, you know, defend themselves or, or add more information that was missing, and then we'll go, go to the public. I, I, I just want to be uh, very clear. I, I don't see my remarks as defending cost-benefit analysis as a way of making decisions. I want to be very clear that the EPA actually uses other tools to reach its decisions, and OMB asks us to do cost-benefit analysis and OM to, to facilitate OMB's review of what we do. Um, and I, I'm not sure I would even uh, characterize FIFRA as being cost-benefit analysis in the uh, of certainly of requiring it in the sense um, that I described of, of applying discounting, monetizing, uh, non-monetizable costs and benefits and these sorts of things. So I just want to be clear about that. I just have a couple of comments and I'll, I'll be very short. Um, I've taught this, uh, this area for a long time as a professor and I quiz my students all the time about how they buy cars. I myself have never met anyone who buys a car using cost-benefit analysis. And by that I mean nobody I know says the car costs $30,000, the pleasure I'd get from a sunroof would be I'd monetize that at $1,000 a year, the safety to me is worth $15,000 a year, uh, the really good looks to me, oh, 12.5 a year, and then I'll discount all of that with a 7% 7 discount rate over the 10 years I plan to own the car. Nobody does that. Uh, it, no one I've met. Uh, what, what folks mainly do, if I can just use my anecdotes, is they use a cost effectiveness model. They say, what are the things I want in a car, X, Y, and Z, how much can I reasonably afford, and they buy the car. Uh, and, and in some ways, if you want to think of it, that's what we do with our technology-based requirements at EPA. We say, uh, you know, how much protection, uh, you know, what would it do to protect so, you know, uh, a, a certain body of water? Uh, what is, what's feasible? You know, what, what is technologically feasible without throwing an industry into bankruptcy or, or so on. So that's just one point. The, the, the second point about uh, low probability, high risk events is where CBA breaks down. And uh, two wonderful books, one by Richard Posner and one by Cass Sunstein, both make this point. Um, they make the point that low, uh, that probability neglect actually doesn't happen 
when you're talking about low probability events. What happens is when you get to events that are less than 1%, people cognitively bias them to zero. Uh, Sunstein's co coined the term called uh, bias to zero. And so he is explicit in his book called Worst Cases uh, about the limits of CBA when we're talking about uh, worst case scenarios. And he in fact suggests workarounds which include cost effectiveness. Um, the, uh, the last thing that I, I, I wanted to point out is that I'm, I would be, um, it, it's not my role at, at EPA, my, my role at EPA is to make sure we follow the laws and we decide things as, as, as we're told to by Congress. Uh, but in looking at many of the statutes, I, I, I don't see a hidden cost-benefit analysis included in the statutes that Congress writes for us. In, in other words, I, I think a plain statement rule, if it were to work, might better be seen as do what the statutes say unless there's a plain statement to use cost-benefit analysis, because that itself is a value choice. Um, it, to my knowledge, I'm not sure the words cost-benefit analysis actually exist in any statutes that govern EPA. We're, we're told to consider lots of things, uh, but we're not told to use cost-benefit analysis. And uh, I, I suppose if, if Congress requested that we, or mandated that we do that, we would then need some guidance on how to do it. Uh, but it seems to me there are just too many statutes which go out of their way to suggest that we shouldn't be using cost-benefit analysis, including the Clean Air Act, which was the subject of the, of the trucking case that, that, that you mentioned as, as being an ambiguous case. But I think it even Justice Scalia found it extremely clear that uh, the plain statement in the statute was no cost-benefit analysis. Well, I just want to disagree with one piece of that, and, and that is, you know, when we do act for ourselves, of course we're doing cost-benefit analysis. We're, we're weighing, do we, you know, how much we want something, what we're willing to pay for it. We don't do a careful listing of everything on both sides of the, we don't need to. You know, when, when I act for myself, I know what my own values and likes and dislikes are. I know what I'm willing to pay and what I'm not willing to pay. There's a reason why we do that much more rigorously on a, a society-wide basis than we do individually. But when we substitute terms like cost-effectiveness, that's a way of saying, I don't really like all the balancing. I don't want to do it that way. I want to do something very different. And that is risky when we're talking about social decisions made for us by government officials. I, I've been a government official. I have respect for government officials. You know, I'm not here denigrating government officials. But when you are making decisions for a whole population, you have a special responsibility to do it in a way that really does account for all the costs and the benefits of what you're doing. And there are lots of pressures on you that come from different people. You know, when Jason was talking about who plays in the process, there's a reason why the lights dimmed when Jason was talking. I mean, yes, business is involved in the process, so are advocacy groups. The reason why OIRA sits as it does and it has done it <coughs> under the Carter and Reagan and Clinton and all the administrations we've had for 40 years is because there's some concern about what pressures are brought to bear on the agency and whether the agency decisions might be not consciously but unconsciously biased in one direction by the, the groups that are pressuring them. So, you know, I think we have to look at a, a bigger picture than just who comes and meets with OIRA. We have to look at who's playing in the greater government process. And I think to the extent we can get this to be a process where the costs and the benefits are all looked at in a transparent uh, way, we're, we're better off. Just, just jump in with three quick observations. First on the kind of how do people decide how to buy things, including cars. Um, there's a famous uh, 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 passage that Benjamin Franklin wrote up about his approach to, uh, to difficult problems. He called it his prudential calculus. And he would take out a sheet of paper and write on one side all of the advantages and on the other side all the disadvantages. Not everybody's Ben Franklin. Uh, so yes, some people make emotional decisions. But if you're engaged in public policy, I th would think you would do something that's much closer to the Ben Franklin prudential calculus than you would to, you know, kind of this feels like the right thing to do. So that's the observation on that. The second point on, on bias to zero is, 
Yes, I mean, this is a well-observed empiric effect. But that's precisely why in public policy, no you know, low probability event that t comes true tends to not, not to be responded to. New lessons are generated. What happens if you have a crisis like that is you get a post hoc crisis response. We're probably seeing something like that now. So uh, you know, the question is, if you're doing an analysis that is engaged in a forward-looking prophylactic approach, it's probably not such a huge defect in policy that you're not uh, you know, planning for exactly the po most possible catastrophe. Uh, and then the third observation is the, the Clean Air Act, I, I respectfully submit to you, you know, the, putting aside the decision, the American trucking case, is not clear about how to consider costs and benefits. Right around the time of the American trucking decision, in a, that case involved the NAAQS program, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. There was a decision, uh, Michigan versus EPA in the D.C. Circuit, which essentially did apply something like this clear statement rule I'm arguing for, that if a statute's not clear, it should be read uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, require or at least uh, allow a look at costs. Uh, and, you know, that case cert denied, you know, it's not a situation where the court sort of uh, wanted to step in. There's a long history behind the specific program that was held there to, to have been clear. But I think if you were to take a look at it, you were put it side by side with provisions that the Supreme Court has authorized uh, or required the use of looking at uh, costs or, or uh, comparing costs and benefits on, you would see that it's really hard to find a coherent line through those cases. And that's why I'd propose that there be something like, you know, a much more unified rule. I'd just like to follow up on what a few people have touched on and the difference between individual decisions and, and government decisions. Um, I think the reason we're okay with an individual cost-benefit analysis being sort of fuzzy and influenced by our own personal biases and emotions, and said so we're okay with that. We, we know what we want. Um, there are biases. You know, if I make a decision just because my mother told me to do it, that's okay with me. But um, when we get up to the government level, we, we want more transparency than that. We want, you know, things put down in black and white so we can make sure that there aren't biases that, that we wouldn't approve of, that there aren't certain parties that have, you know, more access than maybe they should. And cost-benefit analysis holds the promise of presenting that transparent government decision-making. Um, the problem is we're not there yet. Um, you know, Ron talked about precaution as being a way to, to inject bias in, into decisions. I think historically cost-benefit analysis has been a way to inject certain biases into decisions. And what we want is a, a more transparent cost-benefit analysis that eliminates some of those biases. Okay, anything else from the panelists first? Well, why don't, why don't we open it up to the uh, floor and we'll have speakers, yes. Can anyone not hear me? I'll just speak up louder. I'm a little bit. You need it for the tape. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, so my question to review, apparently for the tape, um, I was alarmed to, to hear what seemed to be uh, a suggestion by you that, that there's less direction by way of cost-benefit analysis in the statutes than I would have hoped. But I'm wondering if you're successful in heading the direction that you appear to be proposing, are you not just setting yourself up for a Chevron trap on the other end? I do energy litigation. We have enough problems with agency deference just dealing with the just and reasonable standard and with substantial evidence standard. So even if you were able to achieve a sort of hard line, you have to do a cost-benefit analysis, can't the agency just sort of survive on more than a scintilla but less than a preponderance of evidence supporting its, its ultimate determinations applying cost-benefit analysis? Well, that's a substantial evidence test, uh, not to be confused with Chevron. Uh, and uh, but but I, I heard Rob to be going, Rob Virchik to be going to a place I think similar to what you were saying, that you know even if you have a statute like FIFRA that refers to costs and benefits, that it doesn't establish a cost-benefit analysis, and that has to be because of Chevron, because it's not so it doesn't use those magic words, so therefore it can't be read to create that kind of analytical straitjacket to use Jason's word. So yes, I think there is an issue there. I, I, I guess I would, you know, maybe I, I should have, you know, specifically used the words a modest proposal. I was, you know, proposing, I think, a rule that would at least uh, uh, potentially be seen by some as moving in the right uh, direction and be kind of consistent with what it is that uh, serve a kind of substitutionary function for, for the non-delegation doctrine, which is now 
an under-enforced constitutional norm. So the issues of, of Chevron and whether there's too much deference to agencies is probably uh, another panel that uh, uh, Dean Reuter uh, and Doug could arrange, but, uh, but I, I, that, that one I think is too big a problem or issue to take on for today. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, comment and a question. First, I'm astonished and gratified that the Obama administration's representative here today is embracing uh, plain meaning uh, readings of federal statutes in dispute. Um, <laughs> boy, that, that's a memo you should write immediately to your friends at the Department of Justice. Um, I'm not sure they're with you on that. Um, <laughs> My question is, is this, we've heard very little discussion on the greenhouse gas emissions rule that EPA um, started um, under President Bush, and um, I'd like Mr., well, this is for the whole panel, but I'd like Mr. Clark's um, thoughts on the litigation if he wants to wade in on the challenge that his firm, among others, is uh, pushing against what I think is um, an astonishing overreach of federal um, regulatory power into um, every sector of the economy and indeed into all sorts of um, domestic regulatory agencies that haven't really had any say in what the rule is going to be. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start that. I don't want to monopolize things, so, you know, uh, I hope everyone will feel free to jump in after I respond to that question. I think there's the, the provision of the Clean Air Act that's at issue in the, uh, in the greenhouse gas uh, litigation and at issue in the four rulemakings that EPA has put together on that is Clean Air Act Section 202. And it has actually uh, an instruction to consider costs in there. Uh, but very interestingly enough, the administration, by doing four different rules, has really found a way to kind of avoid looking at the costs of economy-wide regulation of greenhouse gases. And it works kind of like this, and this is in part the challenge. Step number one is to make an endangerment finding, which is purportedly a pure science finding, and so therefore it doesn't have to consider costs. Once you make the endangerment finding, so the argument goes, that was in the first rulemaking, the endangerment finding rulemaking. In the second rulemaking, the so-called auto rule, then you have to have an auto rule because you've made an endangerment finding. And then you only look at the costs as they're imposed on the auto industry, not the costs as it would be imposed in the entire economy. Then, in the, uh, in the third rule, uh, you're told that if there's an auto rule, if there's any rule, any regulation of greenhouse gases under the Act anywhere, then there has to be regulation of greenhouse gases from stationary sources. And that's just not a choice, so you don't need to look at the cost of that. The Act mandates that if there's a regulation of it somewhere, there must be regulation of stationary sources. So you've avoided looking at the cost. And then the fourth rule is the tailoring rule, where the Obama administration says, look, we're doing you a favor. We're going to cut back how much we're going to regulate by increasing the statutory thresholds at which there's regulation. So voila, we've done a four-rule package, and we've never looked at the costs that are imposed in the entire national economy. So it's a very clever approach to try to avoid doing, looking at costs on anything other than the auto industry itself. Well, I'm not sure I, I would entirely agree with, with that characterization of, of the rules or of the the cost-benefit analysis conducted at, at various stages. Um, I think it's important to point out that um, the, the car efficiency rule, the, the greenhouse gas tailpipe rule, um, has tremendous net benefits. Um, it actually has negative costs, meaning consumers will save money. Um, they'll have to buy less fuel and, as a whole, will save money on top of all that the health and environmental um, costs. Now, now, in terms of you know, whether EPA has done a full um, economic analysis of, of the costs and benefits of regulating greenhouse gases, um, they actually, um, due to be released today, are doing another um, economic analysis of climate change legislation, which does look at the effects of economy-wide greenhouse gas uh, regulation. Um, the rumor is yet to be seen, but we'll, we'll maybe seen that they're maybe including the benefits analysis um, in this um, release today. That would be a, a nice change. Um, so we, for the first time, have a clear picture of the actual benefits versus the costs. Um, but if you do the calculations, and my institute has done some work on this, and I 
would encourage you to go to our website and read our reports that find that economy-wide regulation of greenhouse gases would actually have net benefits, um, not net costs. And in terms of all the EPA action being an overreach, um, you know, these are the steps that are required by the Supreme Court ruling and by the, the statute as it exists today, um, let alone required by, by science. Um, if, if Congress wants to, to make a change, they certainly have, have that right, and I, I think EPA would, um, you know, several of officials are on record saying that they, they hope Congress enacts legislation that will change, um, you know, how, uh, change the approach to greenhouse gases and, and take this out of these particular sections of, of the, the Clean Air Act. Um, Congress hasn't done that yet, and EPA is, is, is simply doing what, is, what they're legally required to do under the laws that exist right now. Robert, do you have any response? I'll just uh, echo that. Um, ev everything that we've done at EPA concerning greenhouse gases since, um, since Mass v. EPA has, has, has been done well it, since I've been there in, in the Obama administration. Every, everything that we've done at the EPA um, has been with the intent of following the law as it's written. Um, and we would like nothing more than to have uh, uh, legislation that uh, that governs this area of greenhouse gases, uh, but until we have that legislation, um, we see it as our as our legal mandate to address climate change. Other questions? Yes. My question is for Rob. Um, I was interested in your uh, preliminary comments about different ways that the statutes provide for EPA to approach the risk management decisions and. And you made a point a couple of times about how uh, FIFRA, for example, and maybe not very many of the uh, statutes that you've looked at have a cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. required. And you referred to something called the open-ended balancing yes. approach. And could yes. you explain what the analytical framework is for that and how, what's, where the rigor comes in that type of approach, just to elucidate it a little bit further? Well, I would be happy to. I'm going to have to be a little bit uh, open about it uh, because of, of my position and because uh, different uh, offices, it, according to different rules, we, we use it in, in different ways. The, the uh, statutes I'm thinking about are uh, the pesticides rule or pesticides law, FIFRA, uh, TOSCA, which is the Toxic Substances Act, um, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, um, also. Uh, has, has been read to, uh, to ask us to incorporate uh, discussions of, of benefits and costs. Uh, we, we look at the benefits and costs involved in, uh, in the regulatory activities, including in some cases opportunity cost loss, uh, and including in some cases uh, overall uh, social costs or social benefits. Um, but it, it does not uh, it, 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 it's done with an eye toward putting everything on the table and, and, and you know, being Benjamin Franklin, if you will. Um, but it, it's, it's not always done with the kinds of trappings that cost-benefit analysis uh, often has, which, which uh, has particular discount rates used uh, and particular uh, ways of, of monetizing non monetizable things. I, 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 I don't want to say any more than that because I don't want to mislead anybody. But, but, but I will say I'm not against Benjamin Franklin, and I want to just be very clear about that. Um, th there, there's a difference in tallying up costs and benefits in what I call their natural units, like lives saved, uh, illnesses avoided, uh, uh, acres of wetlands preserved. There, there's a difference between looking at things in their natural units the way Benjamin Franklin did and looking and converting everything to dollars and cents because then you get some pretty strange things. You start uh, you know, monetizing IQ points and monetizing uh, uh, the, 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 the worth of a child to a mother based on the time it takes her to based on the time she spends putting, strapping an infant into a car seat. Uh, you, get, you get some strange numbers. And, and I just want to say, we use numbers like that at EPA. Uh, the White House uses numbers like that. They serve a purpose, uh, but they, they don't necessarily drive you to 
a, a regulatory decision um, that I think many people would be comfortable with. And for that reason, Congress has asked and mandated that the, that the EPA use other ways of reaching decisions when it chooses how to regulate. There was another question way over there. There'll be a mic coming to you. You mentioned the um, net benefit from greenhouse gas emissions. Well, we're right now, as everybody knows, doing the um, purported energy bill, comprehensive energy bill on, on the Hill. And if you have a uh, renewable portfolio standard, you are putting some at an advantage, over, many over, uh, over other people. So how can you how can you say it's a net benefit to to society when you're going to have areas that can't meet the um, new source review no new source review excuse me um, the rule and and are going to have to um, import the wind renewable sources. Um, if, if that was addressed to me, I can start the conversation on that. I think what you're talking about, um, and I'd agree, is the need for a distributional analysis. It's not enough to just analyze what the costs and benefits are in aggregate. You need to look at where, who's experiencing which costs and which benefits and where that lines up. Um, that cost-benefit analysis doesn't do a great job of getting at the distribution. Um, there's a definite need to improve the work on analyzing um, dis distributive effects. Um, but on, on some level, that doesn't change how cost-benefit analysis can inform the decision. And that's what it should do. It should inform the decision, not, not make the decision. Um, but if you, you have a, a rule that, in the aggregate, will generate net benefits, but then have some distributional effects that we maybe don't like, that can be taken into consideration in designing certain exemptions. Maybe it'll apply to, to different people in different ways. Um, maybe there's another layer of regulatory protection or a, a way of sort of, um, of compensating those who are particularly um, affected by, by a given rule. And it's also important to look at the distribution, not just of a particular regulation, but of the distributional consequences of the regulatory scheme in general. And any given rule, you're going to have winners and losers. There's, there's almost no way to avoid that. Um, what we want is, on the whole, um, government action to have most people come out a as winners. Um, that's what we'd like to see. Um, we're not quite there on, on analyzing those distributional effects over the whole regulatory scheme. Um, I, I agree that we need to do, do more of that and to, to pay attention to, to those effects. Can I, yeah. just a, a two, two comments on that. One is to raise something that, that Doug raised in his introduction that we really haven't talked about yet. On the distributional impacts, this is just a question for, for Rob and, and Jason. If we're talking about distributional effects that have distribution, uh, distributional effects essentially on income, you know, uh, different uh, stratums of, of income, why do we need that if we have what we really have these days, which is a negative income tax, right? We have 50% of the people in the country who aren't paying a federal income tax, so, and they're getting a sort of positive transfer from the Fed. So if we have that as the sort of overall kind of equity guarantor, should individual rulemakings really be getting in, you know, on an individualized basis and trying to kind of, isn't that uh, in, in some sense a kind of form of double counting? So that's, the, that's one question. And then the, the other one is, on the, on the other kinds of things, which I'll call the kind of softer, additions to cost-benefit analysis that Jason had up in his slide with, I think, Cass Sunstein's picture on it. If we had, uh, you know, good judicial review under the Data Quality Act, which we don't have, we have one Fourth Circuit case that says it's not judicially reviewable, you'd be able to penetrate into those softer things and, and they wouldn't necessarily hold up on judicial review. The harder things would hold up on judicial review because there would be a firm analysis behind it. So I'd also toss that out as, you know, while I'm while I'm imagining I'm a czar who's picking different policies uh, just for purposes of this panel, uh, a, a judicially reviewable data quality act would also, also be another good thing to have. Um, J just to, to clarify, d distribution's important because we as a society, uh, sort of through democratic, uh, democratically elected officials, we've decided that, um, that this kind of distributional fairness uh, over uh, 
by class or by race uh, or in some cases by age, that it's something that we value as an independent value. And so it, it, at EPA, for instance, we're told uh, by, in the Clean Air Act, for instance, by Congress to pay special attention to, to sensitive groups, for instance, just as, just as one example. Um, so what we don't do is say, uh, and I'm not sure this is where you're headed, so forgive me, but, but what we don't do is say, well, the folks in, in, this, in this poorer neighborhood don't pay taxes for, for various reasons. Therefore, they don't need the same quality of air as, as the folks in a neighborhood where people pay a lot of taxes. We, we don't do that for a number of reasons. One is it's not in our jurisdiction to consider who pays what amount of taxes in, in, in giving standards. Uh, but, but, but the other thing is, is, is I think that, that we've reached a, at least some sort of consensus in the electorate that that, that would be distasteful, um, that there's some minimum amount of, of, of healthy air in the commons that everyone should have, re regardless of whether they're getting a, a benefit by not having to pay taxes. The, the basic tools of cost-benefit analysis can tell us where the costs and benefits are. It can't compare across individuals uh, who's better uh, at, at bearing one cost or who's better at bearing another cost. And no form of analysis that we have does a good job of capturing distributional effects. So it's better to describe them and leave them to one side of the calculation. Uh, the, the one thing I, I did want to add to the uh, analysis we were talking about, I think you, Rob, had mentioned that when you're dealing with low probability effects, that frequently people over discount. Uh, those. The other thing we find is that sometimes people under discount them. Sometimes they dramatically inflate uh, the, the costs of improbable events. The, the one thing we do know is that systematically the more remote an event is both in probability and in time, the harder it is to deal with it. And that's true for all forms of analysis. Uh, if we're trying to do the analysis in a transparent way, though, it's always better to get all of those on the table and to show what it is that's actually driving the analysis we're getting to. The panel's been focusing on decision making in a formal rulemaking context, and I think as all the panelists are probably aware, a significant amount of EPA's influence and regulation, in quotes, occurs in non-promulgated, non-APA, non-transparent type mechanisms. In fact, there are entire regulatory programs that run essentially on non-promulgated guidance. So I'm curious as to how the discussion of decision making, um, when one of the hallmarks of, of Administrator Jackson's approach at EPA is for transparency, is how does that relate to what I think is an institutional bias, regardless of administration, against formal regulation and doing things through informal guidance instead? Do you have particular examples, or do, or do you want uh, me to? Corrective Action Program. They, almost the entire program is done through guidance. And, and mm -hmm. the same is for FIFRA, in fact. FIF, I mean, FIFRA, FIFRA, some of TSCA. Pesticide registration notices, which are total guidance documents. There's right. no, no APA, no notice right. and comment rulemaking. So, CERCLA, there hasn't been a change to the NCP um, that's had effect for, what, 20, close to 20 years at this point? Yet the program clearly has evolved. Lots of examples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, you are, <laughs> you are right that transparency is a hallmark of, of the EPA under Administrator Jackson and, and a hallmark of the Obama administration as well. And, and you should know, I mean, we, we talk an awful lot about it at the pos policy level, about how to make it, uh, how to make it bigger and, and more robust. I think your comment's well taken, that there are significant uh, uh, regulatory programs that, uh, uh, that are that are driven in in some senses by guidance. What what I can say is that it, at the management level at EPA, uh, when we have options uh, of making things available, uh, putting them online, making them easier to see, uh, we absolutely do it. And one thing that I'll encourage you to do, perhaps uh, w when you get your iPhone out of the door. Uh, is uh, if you Google something called gateway, it, it, if you Google something called rulemaking gateway, you'll find uh, so, uh, 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 a, um, a portal that actually comes out of the Office of Policy that tells you everything 
that, that, that is publicly available about every rule that we're even thinking about right now, from the pre-publication stage to the publication stage. And not only that, but we flag things in terms of, of things you might be interested in, like federalism, states' rights, uh, tribal interests, environmental justice, healthy kids. And you can go and you can click, if you're interested in federalism, and find every single uh, rule we're thinking about uh, that we think might have to do with something like that. Now, I'm going a little astray, I realize, uh, and, and I, I perhaps can't answer directly your, your question for a variety of reasons. But what I can tell you is, is, is that transparency really is something that we work on, and it's obviously uh, uh, an, an unfinished project at this point. I would say, first of all, the, the gateway is a terrific tool. Um, but then there's just a quick note um, in terms of guidance documents. Um, under Bush, there was a new executive order for how OIRA does review, and guidance documents were included in White House review. Um, Obama rescinded the Bush order, but then Peter Orzag issued a memo saying, well, we're actually still going to do review of guidance documents for the foreseeable future. And Obama is a little overdue, but hopefully someday we'll be coming up with a new executive order, and it'll be interesting to see how guidance documents are treated. But I, I think that more there is at, at least some White House review of guidance documents. Now, whether that addresses all of your concerns is, is another issue, but um, I think that there is a push towards transparency and review of, of things like guidance documents. I, I just, let me just add, add, add one other thing, if I can, because I just, it, it just occurred to me. Uh, but but it, it is often true that when many uh, documents, including guidelines, uh, went to OMB in the past, that they often didn't show up in any, uh, in any way that could be scrutinized by the public. They, they either weren't docketed, uh, and, and people simply, or they went informally. Uh, a lot of documents would go informally and then get vetted and then come back to the agencies, uh, where, where in some cases, you, uh, you know, they, things would happen and they might, you know, send them back uh, to OMB again in a formal way. Um, at EPA, we, we have been explicit about this. Lisa Jackson's been explicit. And anything that we send to OMB, uh, whether it be a guideline or, uh, or, or uh, anything r uh, other than your straight rule, uh, if, if we are legally allowed to, uh, we make it available to the public, either by putting it on the docket or by putting it somewhere on our website that the public can reach. Um, and that's an internal policy of EPA, and it's, it, it, it demonstrates, again, this, this dedication we have to transparency. Uh, I think that, yes, I mean, I think EPA is to be commended for putting more things up on their website, but this uh, change in Bush policy that Jason was describing, it seems to me, is a move in a, a, a less transparent direction rather than a more transparent direction, uh, because you're having, you know, what is functionally informal review uh, and not sort of the review under the open established OMB policy that had been put in place. But, you know, lest I be uh, misinterpreted as sort of, you know, striking a blow just against the Obama administration, I'll say that I, I think the Bush administration missed a chance to go farther on guidance documents. Uh, under the D.C. Circuit decision, the Appalachian Power Line cases, these guidance documents are unlawful. And so uh, there were discussions about whether to take that as a firm uh, position and, and kind of run with it, and it uh, didn't bear fruit in the Bush administration. And I'll say my diagnosis of that problem is that the bureaucracy, the career bureaucracy, is addicted to guidance documents, uh, and that it really will take the strong medicine of a president who will clamp down on their use and, and courts that will uh, uh, find them to be unlawful to, to end their use. I guess one question about them, too. I mean, we, we know when cost-benefit, or at least Rob indicates in some cases, it's not pure cost-benefit required by statute, but we know when that's uh, an element that the agency, in this case EPE, has to do something about in a, in a notice and comment rulemaking. What is the position in guidance documents uh, in terms of the requirement to, especially let's take FIFRA, where there's you have to weigh, you should be weighing benefits and costs, what, what can they can they avoid that in I mean it's a very simple-minded question can they avoid that in a, in, a, in a guidance document uh, I'm not going to be able to give a satisfactory answer to that un, un, unfortunately um, okay. I what, what I can say is that we do engage in in uh, in, in guidance documents uh, uh, we 
uh, often uh, make these, uh, open them up to public comment mm -hmm. and, and, and try to, uh, you know, facilitate the sort of transparency to those documents um, th that we think is merited. But uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a question I'm just not able to address right now. Okay. We have time for one more question. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up on the guidance documents as between different agencies. For example, the U.S. Department of Labor has just announced a new policy saying they're going to convert their approach on guidance documents so that when they get a request from an individual employer, they will respond with an answer that is valid agency-wide or subject white. So my question is, are, are you getting direction from the White House that's consistent with the direction the Secretary of Labor seems to be articulating? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> that's the problem with transparency. You get caught in a bond very quickly. Okay, if there are no further questions, I want to give uh, the panel a round of applause. <laughs> and with, with cost benefit, I'll leave you with the famous words of our Supreme Court, I know it when I see it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thank you all for coming. It's, I think it was a very rewarding discussion. Thank you. Thank you.